Our last episode ended on a somewhat unsatisfying note as we weren't quite able to show the animation we wanted. There were two main reasons for this. One, we hadn't perfected the actual animation, meaning that we attempted to use a very crude way to lift her fluid up across the screen, skipping past some frames. Imagine if Disney skipped three-fourths of the frames in one of their animations because the deadline was approaching and the animator didn't have time to draw them all. That would also have been noticeable for the audience. So this problem had an easy fix, we needed to make a better animation. Two, the other problem was a bit more complex. To counteract gravity, we had implemented a pulse width modulation algorithm, or PWM, that was supposed to decrease the holding force of certain magnets in the animation. This algorithm was simply not running fast enough on our Arduino Mega. Gravity causes a lot of problems in a ferrofluid display, but before you say, well, place it on its back then. We want to point out that even though gravity is annoying, it's also part of what makes a ferrofluid display so mesmerizing. Therefore, we want our display to stand upright. But this choice leads to a few challenges. Most evident is the mechanical time delays caused by slowness in the ferrofluid itself. It can only be moved so fast, and since it has to be moved against gravity, it is impossible to magically turn on a pixel out of nowhere. So fast is however fast enough for it to fall down quite quickly, meaning multiplexing is not an option. This means that we need to connect all the magnets in parallel, literally controlling each of the 252 magnets individually. Electrically controlled on-off switches exist in form of drivers, which are literally just that. A switch that will be closed when the voltage <coughs> is applied and open when not. However, because each of the drivers need a separate <coughs> wire to the Arduino, we soon <coughs> run out of GPIO ports. The way we solve this is by adding a buffer between the Arduino and the drivers so that we can still send data sequentially. But we can now keep <coughs> all the magnets on at all times. This buffer is implemented with a 32-bit shift register, consisting of four daisy-chained 8-bit shift register ICs. We've now established a way to control each magnet and reduced the number of wires connected to the microcontroller from 252 down to 36. Three wires per PCB and one PCB per row. Now to the problem of PWM. Without PWM, gravity will make sure that if you attempt to power a column of adjacent magnets, more ferrofluid will accumulate in the lower pixels, leaving the upper pixels drained. However, since we don't have a hardware implementation, we need to implement PWM in software. This makes the PWM frequency dependent on how fast the code executes, meaning we need really fast code, so this becomes unnoticeable. The most obvious improvement we could do was to make all shift registers run on the same clock. That way, we remove a lot of unnecessary instructions from a time-critical part of our code. However, this idea can be taken a step further by making sure that all our output pins are connected to the same port on the Arduino. This means that all the pins will have their values stored in the same register, so we can write them all at once. This means we can parallelize writing an entire column of data. So we only have to shift out 21 clock pulses instead of 252. However, since the Mega is an AVR-based 8-bit microcontroller, it is not possible to fully implement this step with all 12 shift registers. So in order to test how much faster the code runs, we implemented it on 8 of them instead. This reduces the resolution to 8x21 during the tests, or more accurately, 8x19 since we are currently using a fire fluid tank that is a bit too small. To get some actual numbers out of the test, we hooked up a logic analyzer to our Arduino on an unused pin which we set high right before the shift sequence starts and low when the shift sequence ends. This means we're timing how long it takes to perform one full screen refresh. First we did an analysis on the code we ran last time, so we have a benchmark for the optimizations we are doing. And this laggy, non-working code spends 3.5 milliseconds shifting out an entire screen because it's iterating through a double for loop using Arduino's native digital write function 252 times, and that's not optimal at all. The rest of the processing in the main loop needs 2.4 milliseconds to run, leaving us with a total screen refresh frequency of 170 Hz, or 170 frames per second. This may be enough for the average gamer, but calling them frames per second is kind of cheating, because in reality we're only changing the content of the frames 4 times per second. 4 FPS is the fixed frame rate we've decided to go for because it's about as fast as we can physically move the ferrofluid. Let's have a closer look at what this means. With 4 frames per second and 170 refreshes per second, we have roughly 42 refreshes per frame. These are the refreshes that we have left to implement the software PVM. 
We want the PVM duty cycle to have a resolution of 20 because this gives us a 5% increment. For example. If we want 25% duty cycle, we want to leave a pixel on for 5 refreshes and off for 50. And if we want a 45% duty cycle, we leave the first 9 cycles on and the remaining 11 off. There is one problem though. A resolution of 20 means that we spend almost half of one frame shifting out one PVM cycle. In other words, we only have 2.1 state changes within each frame and get a PVM frequency of 8.5. Since 4 is a fixed number and 42.25 is the result of 170 and 4, if you manage to increase 170, this number will auto automatically also increase and we can fit more PVM cycles within each frame since 20 also is a fixed number, which results in less wobbly fire fluid and opens the possibility for lower holding force in certain pixels. So let's start improving the performance of our setup. First we implement the parallel registry based approach that was discussed earlier. The performance boost was immediate. The execution time of the code is reduced by more than 4 milliseconds, from 5.9 to 1.7 milliseconds. That means that the frequency of our screen refreshes are now at 588 Hz. This is a significant improvement, and our PWM frequency is therefore increased from 8.4 Hz to 30 Hz. And this is actually enough to make the wobbles in the ferrofluid invisible on our camera, because it records at 25 fps, but they can still be easily spotted with the naked eye. You should be able to see it in this 220 fps slow motion video that I did on my phone. Now, there were still some code optimizations that we could make, especially in the way we store and handle duty cycle values for each pixel in each frame. However, we could also just upgrade to a faster microcontroller. And as it turns out, we have a TNC 3.6 laying around, and just in clock frequency alone, that should yield a 1125% performance boost compared to our Arduino Mega. Additionally, the TNC uses a microcontroller with an entirely different architecture, a more powerful instruction set and a generally more powerful MCU in every way. So we may actually expect an even steeper boost, but let's check it out to see if there's any truth in my claims. The execution time of the main loop is now 59.45 microseconds, so this yields a frequency of 16.8 kilohertz, nearly 17,000 frames per second. So if you want to pawn your friends in a game of Counter-Strike, hit us up. The downside is of course that you only have a 12 by 21 resolution and the fact that we're only using every 4200 frame to actually change what's being displayed so maybe it's not such a good idea after all because as mentioned we use a constant frame rate of 4 fps however the more interesting test is to divide the the 17000 fps by the duty cycle resolution which is 20 leaving a pwm frequency of 841 hertz this is almost a 3000% increase from the same code running on the Mega, and almost a 10000% increase compared to the code that we started with, from 2 state changes per frame to 210. Additionally, since the TNC runs on a 32-bit ARM core, it can store all of our rows in a single register. This means we can parallelize the whole thing and we don't have to reduce the height of our display to 8 anymore. At this point I started to become very curious about how fast it's actually possible to do this, so I tried storing our animations in the read-only memory of the microcontroller, meaning they would have to be left unaltered by the program. This gave us an even more insane frame rate at 84,000 refreshes per second or 4.2 kHz PWM frequency, but it came at a compromise with some of the functionality that we envision developing in the future, such as dynamic animations. Additionally, it would limit the size of our animations to whatever size the flash memory could hold. Therefore, we will leave this idea hanging for now, but we may revisit it in the future. The size restrictions on the microcontroller were becoming more and more obvious regardless of this read-only implementation. So we figured it was about time to expand our memory with an SD card. Implementing this meant that we get a much larger delay be between animations, but it also means that we can store what's for our purposes considered as an infinite amount of animations on the board. 
and this will come in very handy for some of our planned projects in the future. In the process of optimizing our code, we came in contact with Larry Bank of BitBank Software, who is a code optimization specialist for embedded systems. And he was incredibly helpful in discussions with us and provided some really good advice for what to focus on when optimizing in the future. Larry is writing tons of blogs and being very active online, helping out others in the embedded world. So you should absolutely check out him and his blog. The link will be down in the description. One of the suggestions that I really liked, but for some reason haven't heard about before, was to make sure that variables that are modified a lot are stored locally instead of globally. One example could be a counter variable that's being incremented within a long loop. This is because local variables are stored in registers instead of RAM. So if your variable is global, you will waste time every time you modify it. He also suggested that we use SPI channels in our shift out sequences and that we look into SIMD features that are native in the ARM Cortex M4. We haven't had time to perfect our code yet, so there are still huge improvements to be made. But for now, we've settled with what we have, so we can focus on making some cool animations that we can show you and the rest of the internet. We would really like to dive deep into our code and explain our thought process, but we feel like we've already been technical enough for one episode. If you want us to make an episode like that, doing a code review, let us know in the comment section. But keep in mind that our code is already available on GitHub for your viewing pleasure, even in its current underdeveloped and finished state. We've also uploaded our PCB design files to Hackaday.io and Hackster.io under an open source license, so feel free to take a look at those as well. Disclaimer. We do not recommend anyone attempting to duplicate version 1 of Fetch, because we already have big plans for upgrades in version 2 that should not increase the system's complexity a single bit, but rather reduce it. Now we basically have a fully functional system at our hands, but we want to make some final cosmetic touches before we call it complete. Therefore, we will not set a deadline for our next video in the Fetch series, because we want it to be as good as it can possibly be, with awesome animations and high production quality. So to make sure that you don't miss the final release video of our display, you can click the bell next to the subscribe button below. Then YouTube will notify you when we release it. Oh, and one last thing. We'll drop the links to some short white papers that we found extremely useful when making this video down in the description. One of them is from Adafruit and concerns memory management in embedded systems, for example showing you how to utilize program memory to the fullest. Uh, the other one is an official ARM white paper that describes the digital signal processing capabilities of ARM Cortex-M processors. They aren't very long and they are both easily readable. We absolutely recommend them. So that concludes this video. Until next time, happy procrastinating! procrastinating.